packing for Philmont and other preparations. Welcome to Conversations with Dad. This is episode number five. I am Bob the Orc, and that is my gamer handle. We're making this video specifically for uh, Dad's Boy Scout troop. Uh, troop 1 in New York City as they make their preparations for Philmont. And then also any other scout troop that, that's wanting to go to Philmont, uh, they're going to find this useful. Or even just broadly speaking for, for any sort of adventure, uh, outdoor adventure. Dad has been to Philmont, uh, I believe, 37 times. This year will be his 38th time. And uh, so, Dad, why don't you give us a brief introduction and then we'll get onto the, uh, onto the packing list. A warning, warning for the wise. Um, I'm old. Uh, you generally don't want to go hiking at Philmont yeah, when you're old, but it, I'm a retired college professor. I have a PhD in economics, taught university level. But uh, for almost 20 years, uh, thanks to your brother, Eagle Scout, uh, uh, he suggested I become a fitness trainer and get a free gym membership. So in my retirement, <laughs> I've been a fitness trainer for nearly 20 years. So if you're a fitness trainer and your body age is young enough, you can still hike it. Otherwise, you have no business hiking Philmont if you're past uh, mid or late 60s. But um, the, the nice thing about Philmont is it prepares you for life. Um, we're fortunate in, in Greater New York Councils, New York City. Uh, we do have scout camps, but uh, getting the kids really out into the wilderness, uh, we don't have flush toilets in the scout camps, uh, is a real learning and growth experience. Now, quickly, what is Philmont? It's a tract of land of around 200 square miles with adjacent land like the Carson National Forest that you can hike on. Uh, Ted Turner has been nice enough to let us hike on some of the land up adjacent to Philmont. So we probably got up toward 300 uh, square miles of land, an area of maybe 20, Philmont itself, 20 miles north and south, 10 miles east and west, plus all this adjacent land. And it, you start at sea level and it's almost like desert. And as you go every 100, 200 feet higher, it's like moving north toward Canada, where it becomes mountainous with pine trees, and finally the tops of the mountains, uh, where it's bald, uh, it's above the tree line. It's a wonderful experience, and I recommend it for anybody. All right. Well, so we're going to, here in just a moment, we're going to get into the details of the packing list, uh, or, or just getting to some, some details on the equipment. And then in the description below, uh, I'm going to post uh, an itemized list that Dad provided. That way you can you can see what you've got in there. And we're gonna go through some examples of the gear that dad has. I'm gonna make some comments uh, from my own experience. And I hope you enjoy. So here we go on the packing list. All right, so now let's get into the actual gear and the packing list itself for Philmont. And this will also apply to other, uh, other uh, exploration survival type uh, adventures uh, as well. So the first thing we have here, it looks like a duffel bag. And uh, tell Correct. me, tell me uh -huh. what's up with that. Uh, this video is partly intended uh, for our crew that going, going to Philmont. We fly from New York City and you put your backpack into this duffel bag. So the mechanical uh, equipment uh, uh, taking all your gear around in the airport doesn't snag and break plastic buckles on your backpack. Uh, so once you get to base camp, you can use this uh, take your backpack out. Well, actually, fly to Denver, uh, transfer the duffel to the bus. In the meantime, you're traveling with a small uh, book bag that you're just, you've got your travel items in and so forth, maybe a water bottle that you can fill once you go through security in the airport. But with this, you transfer it to a bus. We take the bus uh, from the Denver airport. It could be Albuquerque uh, going to Denver or to, uh, to Philmont. And uh, and this we is a lot easier. To, this is a lot easier to manage than the than the old laundry bags that we used to use to keep the right, backpack right. straps safe. It's worth it's worth getting a proper proper duffel bag to do this. So. Uh, and I think that's the one I base... got you back in New York, right? When I was uh, when we were at the North Face store together last time. Yeah, you you were here, and I think we probably bought it at that that point. Yeah, I think we got a couple uh, of those. So anyway, once you're at Philmont, you're uh, in base camp. You're staying in a wall tent with a floor and cots and all that the first night. And then when you're about to go on the trail, you take your excess gear, your travel clothes, things like that. You'll travel in your class A scout uniform and put that in here. And then we have lockers. We can put this in basically for the uh, 10 days that we're on the trail. And then this is the travel bag, just a typical uh, book bag that you can use in travel. I take a rain jacket or a fleece. And so the bus traveling from the airport on down to Philmont base camp, if it's a little cold or air conditioned on the bus, I've got that maybe a water bottle that you can fill in the airport once you go through 
security. Um, any snacks, maybe take some snack items along and so forth. So uh, anyway, moving one, one, on. Well, go ahead. One, one of the things that I used to do is, so I'd have my, tra my little travel bag for the airplane. When we got to Philmont and we switched everything out for the trail, I would take the contents of my travel bag, dump it into the, into the, at the time I was using a laundry bag. And then I would and take, the duffel, you know, yeah. in this case, the duffel. And then I'd roll up the little day pack because I used a really thin, lightweight uh, day pack. And I'd have that with me as an emergency backpack in case I had to carry some extra stuff or in case I needed, uh, you know, Maybe if a I side needed hike a, or something. Yeah, a yeah. side hike or just anything for a small bag where there were a couple instances where, uh, I remember uh, I had to carry some extra gear. I think somebody had gotten hurt, uh, and we were trying to lighten their load, and we filled up uh, extra crew gear into that bag, and I strapped that on top of my normal backpack. So it's always nice to have a little bit of an extra bag if you have the weight capacity to be able to, you know, to, to sure, carry Sure, you could, you could carabine or, uh, or strap it onto your, your regular backpack. Uh, stocking, talking about hiking boots, these are the hiking boots that I use uh, – these are Solomon. There are many, many good brands. You just, whatever kind of fits your particular foot. Uh, there, you notice they've got fairly high tops to them. Uh, I would not wear sneakers or trail running shoes. Uh, they don't have to be as high topped as this, uh, but half or two thirds as high as this. If you're wading through water crossing streams, there's that one place going to Black Mountain. You cross the stream 45 or 50 times. It's nice to be able to step in water that's an inch or two deep. You know, you're stepping on rocks, but you're not afraid to step down into the water bit if the boots are waterproof. Well, and speaking so, of the speaking of the trail running shoes, we had that one kid uh, with trail running shoes, and they fell apart about halfway through the trip. We had to duct tape them together. And, true, you need you need something heavy duty and fairly new. They should be broken in. Um, if you don't do a lot of hiking in them, just wearing them around the house while you're doing video games, watching TV, or whatever, 30, 40 hours of on your feet, just so they kind of accommodate and shape to your feet. But you don't want old, worn-out ones either, or they'll fall apart uh, on the trail. Well, and if you get quality, they're going to last. There, there was some some boots uh, uh, that we got uh, for me. They were there's some sort of I think uh, European, some European brand, and mine were all leather. They were a little heavier, but they lasted me for four Philmont trips. It was it was it was uh, you know amazing the quality. Whereas mm -hmm. most yeah, people... the leather boots take longer to break in, but uh, and these, you know, the fabric uh, are a little bit quicker to. Yeah, I wore them. I wore them feet. all year around New York City just to break them in. It took forever to break them in, but they really, really lasted, and I still have them in my closet. I mean, the soles mostly worn out now, but they still, they're still functional. If I have to do some heavy. Now, as you're hiking work, along through the day and you want to take a break, uh, closed-toed, uh, not flip-flops, but something with closed toes like Crocs either some old uh, sneakers that you could take on the trail, or if you're having to cross the stream where it's, wait, you know, you're wading in knee deep or something, um, you could wear these Crocs and they have closed toes, or you get partway through the day, you want to switch and just air out your boots, put them out in the sun, let them dry out a little bit, put your, take your socks off, let, let your socks dry in the sun, and you could wear these around while you're having lunch. Or if you get to uh, your camp at, in the late afternoon, you can pop these on. It feels really great just to take off your boots and put on something else where these breathe. You don't want an open-toed sandal because you could uh, snag your foot on a sharp rock or stick. Well, and the big, uh, so... thing, the big thing that I find is at nighttime, if I have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I don't want to futz with my hiking boots. I want to just exactly. put something on that's quick. I can go walk over to a tree, do my business. Or if I want to just uh, get around, uh, just around the camp because the hiking boots, mm -hmm. you don't want them to stink up and, and, and wear on you. Now, Philmont, Philmont supplies a tent. The tents are durable and intended to last the whole summer for a series of campers. Uh, in case you buy your own tent, there's a particular brand called Big Agnes, B-A, Big Agnes. And this is a one-person tent. Um, generally, you'd, you'd try and have two people per tent. But if you're the odd person, uh, like uh, if we go this summer, uh, there may be two other men camping together, and then I might have the one-person tent like this. Uh, this is the equivalent of the one-person Big Agnes Tiger Wall, T-I-G-E-R-W-A-L-L. -L. It's a side entry tent. Uh, they also have a very good uh, range a of tents. Side entry uh, called tent. the, That's interesting. Uh, they have one called the Fly Creek, and it has a vestibule, which is nice. You can put your uh, hiking boots in the vestibule, and you know if it rains at night, uh, you know they're right there. Or, or you even put your, your Crocs, uh, your sandals, so to speak. Uh, so if you get up and go to the bathroom at night, 
you've got them right there in the vestibule. A quick thought on so, the uh, quick thought on the hiking boots at night. What I would do is I would put a couple sticks in the ground, and then I would put my hiking boots outside, upside down, so they'd stay dry, uh, and mm -hmm. that way they could air out. You know, just propped up on the sticks sure. upside down. And if they're under the vestibule, then that's even better. If you yeah, if you've got a vestibule, all all the better, and that would keep them dry, especially if there's some dew or mist at night. Um, and then you always want to bang this, them out real good in the morning before you put them on in case something crawled in them. Exactly. Um, here's a scale. It's an old-fashioned scale. The new ones are digital, but I, I weigh things and, you know, do I take this or do I take that? And you try and decide about a few ounces this way or a few ounces that way. Now, one thing that's not on the packing list is this camp chair. Now, some people take a camp chair. Some people don't. Uh, you you had the suggestion about the rain cover on your backpack. Did you want to go into that? Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't personally like camp chairs. I, I've got my luxury items that I'll carry, and so I try to skimp on the other stuff because, like, I'll take extra socks and I'll take extra water bottles. And I, I took a camp chair one year, and I'm a little bit on the heavy side, and I broke the camp chair on the second day, and I had to carry a broken camp chair uh, until we got to a camp that would let me throw it out, a staff camp that let me throw it out, and it was a pain. So what I what I've done ever since that was I take my my backpack cover and I'll just if there's not a rock or something to sit on or if the rocks are wet I'll I'll take the uh, the backpack cover and lay it on the ground. You got to be careful because you don't want to you don't want to rip it or anything. Um, but I would I would usually put the uh, if I'm going to sit out on the ground I'd put the uh, the backpack cover down. And, and sit on that to keep uh, to keep dry if, if it's a little bit uh, you know, a little bit yucky uh, or sometimes this would, I would set my, leaving uh, leaving out the camp chair would be a way to save some money. These camp chairs cost eighty to one hundred and twenty dollars. Yeah, the one you see here with the blue frame is a two pound camp chair. The one right here is a one pound version. I think it goes for about one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty dollars. Um, it's a nice luxury, but it's all, you know, you do everything you can not to carry that extra weight. Yeah. I'm like, like I'm like say 220 it. pounds. So I don't want to, I don't want to risk breaking those. And so the, I would, uh, I would sometimes take my, uh, my, my little ridge, you know, my, uh, my camping mat that I'd sleep on and I'd fold it in half mm -hmm. or fold it in thirds. And I'd set that on top of my, uh, my rain cover for my backpack. Now you were, me. you were using a closed cell foam pad, which right, is fine right. because it wouldn't puncture or have problems. Uh, if it's a blow-up pad, I wouldn't necessarily just put it on the ground, uh, but it worked fine if you had a closed cell well, phone I'd, pad. Well, I'd put it on top of the uh, the the rain cover for the backpack. True. Uh huh. So that that's now really here. Helpful. Here's how I would store a sleeping bag. You see this? Uh, it's basically like a, a big pillowcase. Uh, a lot of times, the better sleeping bags uh, will come with a, a sack like this that you can store it loose and fluffy. Put it in the shelf of a closet. You want to leave it uh, fluffed up. In a sleeping bag, um, you kind of get what you pay for. Uh, they don't have synthetics uh, that provide as good insulation and aren't as lightweight as down. Um, if you don't have a lot of money to spend, you carry that a little bit of extra weight. Uh, the good thing about the synthetic sleeping bags is they can get wet and you don't have a problem um, as well, much as, so as, as, much, a, as much a damp a down bag. Pardon? Yeah, you don't have as much of a problem. It still sucks. Yeah, you don't. In fact, you know, you might reach a camp, you know, a staff camp and want to do a program and you want to air out your sleeping bag. So, uh, you know, your body perspires at night. After two or three nights, the sleeping bag absorbs some moisture and doesn't give the amount of warmth that would give otherwise. So you might zip it open, spread it on top of your tent or spread it over some bushes or a tree limb and let it air out. But if you're going to go off and do a program, spar pole climbing or mine tour or, or black powder shooting, you would be sure to put your sleeping bag back in your tent before you head out and zip the tent up, of course. You don't leave the tent unzipped and let odd critters want to climb in. Now, what, what's your, what so, temperature is your sleeping bag rated for? This this one's rated for 20 degrees, which Philmont recommends. Um, okay. This is a high quality sleeping bag, which is lighter weight. Uh, the, the down comes in various qualities. You know, if it's 600 or 650 fill power down, it's heavier and not doesn't have as loft and as many air spaces as let's say 800 or 850 fill power down or 900 fill power down. Uh, this is probably up toward 850 or 900 foot power down, so it's lighter weight. At my age, you have to come up with every advantage you can to still be able to, to hike film on. Um, now, this would pack down to about the size of a soccer ball. It would. It comes with a nylon stuff sack. Um, as you, you want to keep the sleeping bag waterproof, as you suggested, um, 
you can take, you know, pack it down in the nylon um, stuff sack and then put it inside of a, a plastic bag, twist the top, and maybe put a rubber band to tie it or so, something. Yeah, well, what, or, what, I, what I would do is that, uh, so I had a, uh, my, my sleeping bag was only rated for 40 degrees. It was it was a nice bag, but I'd if it was cold, I'd sleep with more, you know, with, with my extra clothes on. I think yours was a North Face bag, yeah, yeah which no, was, was a pretty good bag. Yeah, it was a really nice bag. And so I'd put inside the nylon, uh, can, you know, a holding bag, which is really small, and then I'd put that and some of my other sleeping stuff inside the waterproof bag and tie it shut. That way it'd take up less space, but it was all, all my sleeping stuff was all waterproof inside. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, if it, was, uh, if it wasn't too cold, I would sleep with the sleeping bag as kind of more of a blanket so it wouldn't get all sweaty if it was, if it was relatively mm -hmm. warm. And I'd only zip it up if it was cold. And a lot of times, uh, since I'd have my I'd have my layers on, I'd have my thermal pants on, I'd have my my regular long you know my uh, waterproof uh, uh, rain pants and stuff like that. I'd have my my thermal uh, top and I'd have a jacket and things like that. So I'd be bundled up anyway. And I found that I didn't need as warm of a sleeping bag. And then uh, it wouldn't sweat up as much because I had other clothes on. And I'd try and keep it as aired as possible. And because mm -hmm. uh, one of the big one of the big fights at Philmont is keeping everything really aired out so it doesn't get all sweaty and yucky. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people like to unzip their sleeping bag three quarters of the way and just have their foot tucked in the foot box and then just use a sort of a blanket on you. Yeah. And in the lower elevations, it's warm enough. You can pretty much do that. And then, like you say, if you've got a, a fleece that you're wearing for your upper body, uh, or if you get cold, you know, you could put, you know, lower body long johns on or uh, rain pants even and just keep yourself a little bit warmer. Um, anyway, moving along, water you, water's a big deal at Philmont. Uh, you'll purify it. There'll be uh, drop uh, tablets that you can put in that have chlorine uh, when you get to, uh, if you have to purify it streams. The staff camps about every third night or so, you'll be at a staff camp, which will, might have a water spigot. But other places you go along a stream, uh, You'd, it helps to have at least one wide mouth Nalgene bottle that you can get the water out of the stream more readily. You turn the mouth of the bottle downstream. If the stream has some debris, you might put a bandana over the mouth of the bottle just to kind of filter the water. And I generally have, have uh, here's some water bottles that weigh all, like literally an ounce or two each, maybe two ounces each, have a clip on this side, have a flip open cap that laps, latches. Uh, and these go flat, so they don't take much storage space in your uh, backpack. I've got three of these here. I think I've got a fourth one somewhere. So they're one quart each or one liter each. And then I've got a pouch here, a dromedary that will go inside my backpack. It's MSR and uh, has a drinking tube that would go through a hole in my backpack along my shoulder and down so I can sip through the day, sip out of that. And then over here, I've got a four quart dromedary. This would be supplied, um, you know, as part of the crew equipment, your, your crew going would wanna have some of these water bottles, dromedaries. They have sometimes plastic cubes uh, that we use, you know, more nearly on our weekend camping trips for a regular scout trip, but these go flat better and are better for Philmont camping. And water, water's very heavy. It's two pounds uh, for a quart of water. Uh, so you want to carry enough water to get you to the next camp. You'd study the map and see what you need for water, where the water pickup spots are along the way. Um, you don't want to carry any more water than you have to because it's very heavy. Uh, but on the other hand, you want to have the capacity to carry quite a bit. And yeah. as these fold pretty much flat, they don't take a lot of space in your pack. And your backpack, as you see, here's mine right here. Um, you want to have your own personal equipment fill no more than about 40 to 60 percent well, of the well, backpack well, well, before, that you've got to have room you, for crew gear and food the, uh, and so on. Before go, you go on go about ahead. the water, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of carrying extra water, and I know that, uh, I know that it's heavy, but the... Well, you're uh, strong. Well, yeah, but, but uh, um, I would always take an extra dromedary with me so that I had the option of filling it up and carrying an extra gallon of water for the for the crew but more importantly when you're using the iodine or the chlorine tablets to uh, to purify the water it tastes terrible at least in my opinion it tastes terrible and so whenever we were going to a dry camp when we're or if we're gonna have a series of dry camps I would fill up on extra water at the at the uh, where, I, where I could get properly purified water that tasted better and I'd carry 
you know, eight quarts or sometimes more. And then the other thing to consider, because uh, you know, that's my luxury, but the other thing to consider is that some people like to add these little flavor, you know, flavor things, uh, you know, Gatorade, Gatorade stuff. sugar, sugar drink, and yeah. And it'll, that'll hide the, that'll hide the taste of the, of the, of the chlorine water or the uh, iodine water. But that's a smellable and the bears and the rodents and other stuff are going to be attracted to it. So you need to always So literally, keep that literally separate. all your water containers that you put sugar drink in have to go up. And if right. they're partially filled with water, it makes it awfully heavy to hoist them up into a tree. Uh, by the way, uh, in more recent years, I think maybe back when you were hiking Philmont, they had iodine uh, that you you put in the thing. And that that was pretty nasty to, to drink. Yeah. Now they have chlorine tablets. You know, our water in civilization is chlorinated. And it's not as bad. So uh, it now it just tastes like right. drinking but what, water. What I was going to suggest is that if you're going to, if you are going to use the, uh, the the flavored water, make sure that it's in a differently marked uh, water container that you know is the smellable water, and then only ever use that one for the for the for the flavored water because that one's always going to be going up uh, in the tree at night. And you don't want Good to point. get that mixed up because we had uh, there are times when some scouts would uh, forget and forget stuff in their backpack, and they'd wake up the next morning, and a rodent would would have eaten its way right through the backpack to get to whatever's inside. You don't want to you don't want to yeah every every like night that. you want to double check you know things like your lip balm you know your chapstick, uh, any candy bar wrappers uh, you know anything like that. You definitely you know want to not have anything that isn't in, hoisted in the bear bag. And that's one of the useful no. things about the about that secondary bag that I was talking about earlier, is if you keep all your smellables in your in your airplane bag, uh, that you're bringing. Yeah, yeah. You, keep. I, I would keep all my smellables in there, and that way at nighttime I just pull it out of the backpack, toss it in the bear bag, and uh, and I'm already set to go, and and I don't have another to worry workaround. About to another workaround for that. You see this bright yellow bag here has a roll top. You can roll the top two or three times and clip it together, and I put my smellables in this. So that's that's my you know some food items. Here's just a packet of spam. You could have flat packets of tuna fish, things like that. Uh, here's my uh, first aid kit, just a very small first aid kit. We've got toothbrush and toothpaste. Uh, toothpaste get one of the little uh, travel size toothpaste, and it can be half or two thirds empty. It doesn't take much toothpaste for a week and a half on the trail. And here's some sunblock. And all these things would go in into that uh, into the smellable right. bag. And, and instead of keeping in it separate places in your backpack, I'd always keep it in the smellable bag. That way I never had to think about it at the end of the day. I just pull the one bag out, up the tree it goes, and I never have to worry about it. Exactly. And we were talking about hiking boots. Here are some socks. These are some fluffy hiking socks. You want synthetic or wool or a combination, a blend of synthetic and wool. And then right next to it, it's kind of dark and hard to see, are some liner socks. And these are thinner socks. Uh, liner socks are optional. You want to size your hiking boots big enough uh, so that you can wear fluffy socks inside. For kids that are growing, uh, having two pairs of socks like this, the liner socks and the other socks, as they grow, that you know they can op opt out of their liner socks and still manage but these are nice, big, fluffy socks. Give lots of cushioning to the feet. And then I'd like to I'd like to interject here. If you want, if you're going to be uh, a luxury, I would always bring double the socks. Even if I had to hide them past the rangers, I would always bring double the socks. Yeah, uh, ranger wants you to take and, as little equipment as possible. And, but and you're I, absolutely right. It's, it's good care. to have. You know, my uh, a wise old man once told me that my shoes is my limousines, and if your feet aren't working right, then you're going to be miserable. And so I don't, like, I don't like having sweaty feet. And so a lot of times what I do at lunchtime is I take off my morning socks. I'd swap them out for my afternoon socks, hang the morning socks from my backpack to dry out. And this way, none of my socks ever got so sweaty that they'd get really nasty. And, uh, and I had the extra socks so I could always wash socks with canteen water along the way, let them dry out. And I always had plenty of clean, dry socks. And that kept my boots from ever stinking up too bad. And if you have a cold night, a particularly cold night, putting on an extra clean pair of socks or keeping a pair of socks oh, to stink for uh, sleeping. Speaking of cold night, uh, don't 
wear your date your hiking socks to bed because they're going to be sweaty and your feet are going to get cold. Wear a clean separate. I had a separate pair of socks that I'd only wear at nighttime. That way they were perfectly dry. There wasn't any sweat. And when I'd wake up the next morning, they you know any sweat that I had at nighttime they would have absorbed from my feet. So my feet were dry. I was comfortable at nighttime. I'd hang them from the backpack. So at any given time, I had at least one pair of socks hanging from my backpack to uh, to dry out. The sun, the sun and that very dry air at the mountain level would uh, pretty well dry things out. Exactly. In fact, uh, back to the hiking boots, um, they have small, you can either take foot powder, which I recommend, or uh, a small one or two little miniature Lysol sprays. They're kind of overpriced, but it's nice to spray your boots every night. Um, just let them, you know, let that kind of sterilize the boots. Otherwise, after about a week and a half of hiking, the boots are going to have a nasty smell and your feet are going to have a nasty smell. See, you don't I, want to get foot mold or fungus. See, I and found then, that, by, cha first, I found that by changing, I found that by changing out the socks, uh, you know, halfway through that the helps day, a lot. that helped a lot. So I never yeah. had to, I never had to spray my boots. They weren't, you know, my feet never mm -hmm. stank that bad because I never let them get sweaty beyond a certain point. And then having now, the liner, another... the liner oh, socks also, mm -hmm. the, having the liner socks also helps with that too. Good point. Yeah. Because you can switch um, out your liner socks and keep the outer fluffy wool socks, and and those last longer because they're not absorbing the sweat. The liner socks are absorbing the sweat mostly. Now on my smellables bag, I I only take the only uh, medication I take is a replacement. Um, for my thyroid, I have my thyroid, it was enlarged a few years ago and uh, it wasn't cancerous or anything, but they removed the thyroid. So I take a, a, a thyroid medication. I have this little pill bottle hang, hanging on my uh, uh, smellables bag. And then as a backup, I have another pill bottle hanging on the back of my backpack. So uh, I've got double backup on this and it reminds me every morning to take my thyroid pill. And and you're, now those pills aren't smellable though, right? They don't, they don't have to go up and um, keep them separate or? I, I've not had any problem with these seal pretty completely. Of course, the smellables bag is going up in the, the uh, bear the bag. Tree, yeah. This one, um, I've never had any problem with it. It seals down pretty tight. Uh, they say animals have like 20 or 30 times as much sense of smell as we do as humans, but I've never had a problem with this. And this is, I think it's a metal, like an aluminum or something that I don't think an animal could chew through probably. Um, now over here, uh, I've got my bag of, of personal clothes and uh, there would be some things on the equipment list. We'd have um, maybe a spare pair of trousers. These are synthetic uh, zip off trousers would be good. So you have the option of either shorts or long pants. This is a synthetic uh, t-shirt. And then uh, I've got, and these, these would be in this, the clothing bag of course, underwear, extra socks, things like that. And you could use that as a pillow if you chose to or you can buy a separate uh, blow up pillow or what i would sometimes then, do is i'd have my mm -hmm. uh, i'd have my backpack since all of my smellables were up in the tree i'd have my backpack and i'd have my clothes uh, inside and i'd use i'd use that uh, the backpack as a pillow although i used to have this little travel pillow that i'd carry along with that was very small mm -hmm. and lightweight and that was that was another luxury that i really loved and it, it all just now, comes they, down to what you can carry. You know, you don't want to overburden yourself. You want to want to be minimalist without being too uncomfortable. Now, they want us to put all our backpacks away from the tenting area, just on the random possibility somebody might have left us smellables in the backpack. Uh, so you put your rain cover on, put these away. You can put them under the dining tarp, or you can put them, you know, clustered against trees or whatever. Um, here is my fleece, uh, kind of a fluffy fleece. Uh, to, for warmth, I find between the rain jacket and this fleece, I'm good even up to pretty high altitudes. And nighttime when it gets cold, you're in your sleeping bag anyway. Uh, speaking of sleeping bags, here's a, a – oh, we don't take this to Philmont. Go ahead. But before but you, you have, before, While you're on the subject of the fleece, there's um, some Under Armour cold weather gear that, uh, that I have for really cold temperature. And it's, it's thinner and lighter weight than that fleece and probably just as warm. You know, when I'm doing mm -hmm. when I'm doing work outside, or if I'm if I'm, uh, you know, walking my Arctic dog through the blizzard, and I'm, I'll be I'll be wearing that. And uh, if you, it's expensive. So, but if you can afford it, uh, Under Armour makes some cold weather gear that's really really nice. I didn't think to bring it out for this video, but it's, 
you know, it's going to cost you probably a hundred bucks for the top and a hundred bucks for the pants, but oh my God, it is a luxury. It is great. But, which brings up something. If you're active, you know, hiking or whatever, your body warms up as if the temperature outside is 10, 20, 30 degrees higher. In fact, uh, there's a saying, be bold, start cold. In other words, once you packed up in the morning, you get yourself up and ready to go. And often you'll be up uh, barely, you know, when it's, you might literally take down your tent before it's daylight and then get everything rolled up and in your backpack and, you know, take off your back, your take off your jacket, uh, rain jacket or fleece and stuff that in the backpack. You're a little bit cold, but once you start hiking very shortly, you'll find that you warm up. So, uh, you know, you want to be, sh you don't want to wear too many layers or you get sweaty. And then once the well, let me, layers let me, are sweaty, uh, let me, they, let me they show you out. Quick. Let me interject real quick. Um, as long as it's tolerable and you don't wear your, you don't have necessarily pants on, or you have the the or the rain pants that you can zip up and, and take off without having to take off your boots. It's easy to wear multiple layers on your uh, on your upper body because you can take off a shirt or you can take off another shirt very quickly. Whereas taking off uh, like your long johns or something, you know, taking off that Under Armour the Under Armour pants, that's a lot more tricky. And so True. what what I would do is, uh, unless it was just insanely cold out, which it usually isn't during the daytime, uh, I'd be in my shorts, and if I was a little bit cold, I'd have my rain pants on because I could take those off without taking off my boots. But I'd have multiple mm -hmm. layers on my, uh, uh, on my upper body, and then when I even thought about starting to sweat a little bit, I'd, I'd quickly take a quick break, take off uh, one of the layers, because you'll get colder if you're sweating, and then that sweat starts evaporating. So you want to you want to avoid that if you can. Good point. Um, I don't think I got into this jacket. This is not something I'd take to Philmont, but for really cold weather, you know, there's a lot of loft to this. This is fluffy, and it's got a good quality down to it. And it's equivalent to your sleeping bag. Um, a lot of people go out and around. What's what's the saying? There's no th no such thing as bad weather, just poor clothing choices. Yeah, and having the right clothing, and and it's an investment. These your the jacket you had at Philmont twenty years ago is still your favorite jacket. Yeah, uh, and of course it was high quality. It was North Face. It was one of their top end type jackets. But you got twenty years of use out of it, maybe more. Yeah, no, I, so I, I still I still wear well. it whenever the weather's lousy, and it's it's probably not quite as waterproof as it used to be, but even in a heavy rain and a heavy storm. You know that thing's fine, and it's better. It was my, real Gore-Tex. Yeah, it, my it my opinion is buy it, Yeah, buy it right, buy it once. It's going to hurt a little bit to buy the right gear, but it's better to do it once. One quick thought on shirts. I know that you're mm -hmm. a big fan of the synthetics. I don't, I don't like the synthetics as much, uh, for the uh, for for an, an inner shirt, and it always seems to make me sweat more and sweat kind of stinky. And so what I would do, is I would bring extra t-shirts I, I i like cotton t-shirts but i'd bring extra t-shirts uh and that way you know wait a little bit more but i thought they were more comfortable for me and i could hang them uh on the outside of my uh of my backpack to dry you know i, I had a bunch of carabiners and, and loopholes and stuff that i could hang hang my laundry while i was hiking i looked like a bum when i was when i was hiking but one of the other things that I, I, I agree that cotton is way way more comfortable it, it is actually um uh, greater near councils uh it will supply, you know, they, they want everybody in the crew to kind of match. And uh, the volunteer who's in charge of this does a very good job. He buys top quality of the synthetics, which aren't as comfortable as cotton, but they're pretty good. And they're better than these really nasty garbage bag type uh, yeah. polyester shirts. The, so uh, generally in the older days, and you hiked there back when we didn't even have the option much of uh, polyester shirts. But now they pretty, I don't think a ranger would let you on the trail with cotton shirts probably. You, you, just, sneak you, just sneak, you just sneak it in. One, one of the things that I'd also like to do is kind of a luxury is I had a really lightweight uh, long sleeve uh, long sleeve shirt that was very loose and it had these sort of vent flaps to help you, uh, you know, to air out. I remember that shirt. Mm -hmm. and, and I still have. It's a little bit tore up, uh, but it uh, would keep and it was collared and it would even if I was wearing nothing else. I'd have that shirt to keep my arms and keep my neck uh, covered, and if I had to unbutton a little bit in the front or whatnot to, you know, let the air flow in, it had these vents. And and I don't I don't know where I bought it. I think it was Banana Republic, 
but uh, you know back when a lot of a lot of advisors clothes. wear shirts like that they can get kind of a tan color right you know, light it was a, color it was a tan color it was good enough that i could kind of fake it being a scout shirt and it keep my arms from uh from burning getting sunburned yeah and uh and and that was that was just a godsend for me because I burn real easy and I don't like I don't mm. like having sunblock on because I like then you, I like then the idea of the long, in fact, Greater New York Greater New York gives you one long sleeve and one short sleeve and a pretty good quality of polyester. And if it if you're hiking through a stretch that's pretty sunny and out and open, uh, or high and exposed, you can wear the long sleeve shirt and it's in a way nicer to have the long sleeve shirt than to wear a lot of sunblock. One one of the things I've thought about doing and I didn't I haven't I haven't tried this recently uh, but I had some, uh, I remember at one point it was really hot out and I had some, uh, I didn't want my arms to get burnt and I, I somehow rigged these bandanas to cover my, to cover my arms to keep them from getting burnt. Uh, I, I think I might've rubber banded them on or something or, or used a little bit of the duct tape that I had. Uh, that, that would work, but you and, know, the, but for our long, upcoming but, treks, but, we'll right, have but then, at least but then one after, long sleeve shirt. Right, but then after that year, that's when I got that long sleeve shirt that was just, it was just glorious. Mm -hmm. I love that shirt. That's my right. adventure shirt. Let's see what else we have here. Oh, this is a scale. You know, the, I take it as far as base camp, and then we can just weigh our stuff and see, you know, how much your backpack weigh, how much does my backpack weigh. Do we want to take this gear or that gear? You can hold it by handle, and you can put your back back hanging on it or specific gear it's a way of measuring i think it goes up to about 75 or 80 pounds uh, so it's a good way of analyzing this would only go as far as base camp then we'd put it in the storage locker um, here are some trekking poles uh, these are called i think they're called z poles these are by black diamond uh, most of the trekking poles you get are something a telescope and you can easily change as you're going uphill or downhill and you can change them in height you want about a 90 degree bend in your arm as you're using these. A lot of people hike without these. As you get older, uh, it's nice having the extra stability. Using your arms takes about 20% well, of the weight off your legs. Even when you're younger, just having, uh, having a good trekking pole or a walking stick, I've got a little heavier duty walking stick that I use, especially for going downhill, because the last thing you want to do is take a tumble. And... Uh, no, it gives it definitely gives better stability. Even picking up a, a good strong stick along the trail, you don't want to cut green wood, but if you find something that's you know recently I've, fallen type wood and cut it cut it to size. Yeah, what what I what I have a, uh, but I, I I think a proper trekking pole or proper hiking stick with a with a wrist strap that's that's designed to have some weight, so you can put your wrist through it. And mm -hmm. I and remember so that one. It, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think I showed it in a previous in a previous video. I still have it. I I still use it. You know, twenty years later, whenever I'm going to go hiking or or backpacking anywhere, even uh, you know anywhere that's going to be a little bit rugged, just uh, it, it helps just having that extra point of contact when you're on uncertain terrain, or if you're crossing a stream, being able to test the rocks before you cross makes a huge difference. So and, and stability when you're crossing a stream. Sometimes those rocks are wobbly, or exactly. uh, sometimes you're stepping on a rock, rock that's underwater by an inch or two and a little bit wobbly. Yeah. Here we have uh, in a waterproof container. It could be in a Ziploc bag. This is a bag of toilet paper. I've got looks like a couple rolls of toilet paper in here, and this is a little shovel scoop sort of thing that I it just cradles right in here with it, and. Uh, so if you have to do your business out in the wilderness, you're all set. And let's see what else here. Uh, this is a little cup with a folding handle and a spoon with part of the handle cut off. Uh, all you need is a spoon. You don't need a fork and a knife. Um, about the only thing you eat in a, where you use a, a dish or a cup would be evening. You could have a something like a breakfast cereal bowl you'd use in the morning, a plastic or metal bowl. Uh, the CR cup works fine. Yeah, I prefer the and, I prefer the metal bowls with a handle because that way, if you need to heat something up or if you have to dip it mm -hmm. into something, it's uh, yeah. This uh, handle just flips open better. on it, and uh, I cut off part of the handle to save one fourth of an ounce or whatever I saved, uh, but it works well enough with that cut off. But you don't need a fork. Uh, the only thing you'd eat in the evening would be a stew. They have different stews. You know, some you know, or with some chicken bits in there, freeze dried chicken, and some with uh, freeze dried beef and some with yeah, mac nothing, and cheese nothing, and so nothing's on. Nothing's big enough that you need to stab it. If you do need to stab it, uh, just mm -hmm. sharpen a stick. Um, 
here are some Ziploc bags. I think these are the two gallon size, um, one gallon, two gallon, they're freezer bags, which are uh, heavier duty. Uh, these are, you know, instead of these more expensive bags, well, you really want your bag to go in the, in the trees um, with the smellables. And you could get by with a, a, a Ziploc bag uh, instead of your clothes bag, but this, this is just a better workaround if you can do it and get it waterproof. But having some Ziploc bags, uh, somebody will say, hey, hey, who can take the fuel bottles? Who can take this? Who can take that? If you're gonna put a fuel bottle in your backpack, you want, want to put it in a Ziploc bag just in case the screw cap isn't all the way screwed down. You don't want your backpack smelling like uh, uh, white gasoline. Speaking of speaking and... of Ziploc bags, um, one of the things that I would do, since Ziploc bags don't hardly weigh anything, and I was always more concerned about space than weight because I was really strong, um, I would put all of my clothes in zip, you know, in Ziploc bags. You know, put a couple of shirts mm-hmm. folded neatly in a Ziploc bag, and then I'd squeeze all the air out and just really compress them down, zip them shut, and I could really compress the gear so they would fit uh, better inside uh, my backpack. And, and I can also position them around, balance the weight, because if you have your backpack balanced properly, you can carry a little bit extra and it doesn't feel like it. Whereas if your backpack's poorly balanced and it's tugging at you wrong, uh, even if it's lighter, it'll be really uncomfortable and it'll wear you out. So I would put all of my, all of my clothes in Ziploc bags. That way I could compress them down. They'd be extra waterproof, so I wouldn't have to worry about that. And I just found that was... Uh, that was useful, and then I'd also have an extra, uh, extra just nylon bag that I'd use as a laundry bag, and mm-hmm. it wasn't necessarily waterproof because it'd be dirty clothes that were already sweaty, uh, and it was usually kind of a larger bag that I would just toss my clothes in, and then at nighttime when I was asleep, I would have the. Uh, since my uh, my camping mat, my sleeping mat didn't go all the way down to my feet. It was either a half or a three quarter length. Uh, I'd use the uh, the laundry bag, kind of flatten it out under my feet to keep my feet warm and off the ground. Mm-hmm. And so that let me get you away with a smaller. Uh, you mentioned backpacks. Um, the one thing's crucial. We've had people, you know, kids would order online and you know maybe not have time to test it out beforehand. Um, and the backpacks, you definitely want a perfect fit. Uh, you want the hip belt to go around the waist, right at the waist level. You want the shoulder straps not to be too high or too low. The straps are too low on, on your shoulders. You'll be bearing, carrying way too much weight on the shoulders. You want most of the weight, you know, maybe 60, 70% of the weight resting on the hips. Um, so you really want to go to a camping store like REI, put some sandbags inside a backpack, you know, put some filler stuff in there, and then walk around a bit and see how it fits. And you want a good experienced person to fit the backpack to you. So you definitely, rather than shopping for cheap hay, there's a special deal on, you know, online and, you know, two for the price of one or 50% off. Backpack has to fit properly or, or you, you're really going to be miserable. One, one, other, one other thought. Um, uh, now, I was doing this more for, for wrestling training, but it's also helpful for, for Philmont. But... Long before the whole reason you do prep hikes and day hikes and stuff like that with full with full backpacks is to start getting you know getting used to it. But what I would do uh, in school is I had uh, not my actual Philmont backpack, but I had a slightly smaller one that I would use as a uh, as a school bag, and I would put a bunch of stuff in it, you know, extra weight. So I was just routinely carrying around every day a sixty pound bag just to build up. You know, extra strength. I was doing it mostly for wrestling, but the more you can train beforehand, the stronger you can be beforehand, the easier the hike will be. You know, dad's always walking up and down stairs and and things like that just to train for the uh, uh, for for the for the trip. And one of the nice things about New York City is you've got tall buildings with stairs, and you probably live in one. Uh, here in Oklahoma, we don't uh, where I'm at these days. We don't we don't have that. I used to I used to uh, uh, hike up and down the stairs at the football stadium uh, back when uh, back to, to train for for Philmont when I was going as an adult advisor. But uh, having ha- you know just the preparation beforehand, fill your fill your backpack with some weight, and 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 walk up and down stairs you know carefully, especially going down, 
that'll 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 help you out in the long run getting ready you know once you're on the trail you'll be used to the used to the weight regarding regarding stairs the building you grew up in as a child is theoretically 35 stories tall if you neg neglect the first floor which is you know that really doesn't count and there's a no 13th floor so it's really 33 floors and i try and go up you know you know taking a weekend camping trip once a month to prepare for uh, philmont is one thing unfortunately with the coronavirus shut down we can't get as much camping as we'd like. Um, so literally once or twice a week, if I can climb stairs anywhere from 20 to 50 to 100 flights of stairs, I've done as much as 200 flights of stairs. It takes me about 100 flights per hour. Um, I like going up and then taking the elevator down. If you fall forward you know, and you want to use the hand railing, if you stumble forward and you're going upstairs, you're only going to fall you know, like a 45 degree angle. If you fall going downward, you got a real problem. You're going to hurt yourself. So at Philmont, you will be going up and down mountains, but uh, often you'll be on trails and things like well, and, that. And, and another thing uh, there to are consider, some rough spots. Another thing to consider, going uphill requires more strength, but going downhill puts more shock on your knees and ankles. And so yeah. going downhill is actually more dangerous. And a lot of why I carry, uh, take a trekking pole is so that I can have extra support when I'm going downhill, especially if you've got a heavy backpack on, and I'd usually carry a pretty heavy backpack because uh, I'm insane. Now, climbing, climbing stairs in a building it isn't practical to use trekking poles, but you do want to kind of skim your hand along the railing or you yeah, hang yeah. on the railing from point to point. Uh, but I'd, I wouldn't recommend going down if, if, if you can just go up and then take elevators down. So Yeah, going, going up will build you the strength that you need. Going down is just extra wear and tear on your knees and ankles that you don't need. Good, good point. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Um, here is a map case. It's got a couple loops on the top that I can clip it onto my backpack. Uh, I have some carabiners. you got a compass in here, Philmont map. Good to have a Sharpie marker if you want to mark where the food pickup is or where you're going to do the conservation project. And it's waterproof. You can use a Ziploc bag. The difference is a Ziploc bag just isn't going to hook onto your backpack. Uh, here is my headlamp. It's the minim minimum size. You don't need a whole lot of light. And then I've got a couple of spare batteries. So you got and I like the lithium batteries. Uh, they cost more, but they last two or three times as long, and they weigh about one third as much. So it's it's worth it just to save a few ounces there. I've got a watch here with a compass on the wristband, and it, the uh, dial sort of glows at night. And this is about all the pocket knife uh, you need. This shows the keys here just for size. Uh, one or maybe two people in the crew should maybe have Leatherman knives that have all the different tools, pliers, things like that. But for most people, if a crew of eight or 10 or 12, uh, the extra people can just take a little knife like this. We get food bags for food for two people and uh, you share with a food uh, mate. Uh, starting out in base camp, you can make a small incision in the bag, uh, take out whatever things you don't want. Maybe you don't want to take along the sugar drink or Gatorade. Uh, yeah, I'd always, take all I'd the always drop that stuff. Yeah, it's just extra weight. Um, so you put that in a pile people take and say, oh, you know, great, I, you know, a pouch of tuna, I'm going to take the tuna. Somebody else says, wow, Gatorade, and they like the sugar drink and, you know, whatever. This weighs about maybe three ounces. It's Here it is next to the keys and the knife. This is a little tiny, this theoretically could go onto a keychain, uh, and it, this is a book bag that's much lighter than this book bag. So you'd have the option of taking a book bag like this or something that's kind of in between. Some book bags are fairly lightweight. Uh, or take this if you're going to do a side hike or something, or you and your buddy <clears throat> can uh, share, you know, proper backpack. Let's say you're hiking up a major mountain from a base camp, and just on a side hike, two or three of you could share one one proper size backpack, and uh, you know, put all your uh, lunch meals and water bottles and things like that in the one backpack and share carrying it between two or three people. And I. I think that got us through just about all the gear. Can you think of any, any yeah, questions yeah, one, or thoughts? Uh, one, one thing that I would do, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm all about certain luxuries on the trail. One of the luxuries that I have is I'd, I'd like good food. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a strong guy. I like to eat a lot. And so I would usually bring along uh, some beef jerky and trail mix. I usually bring along enough for the whole trip, which would add you know, quite a bit of weight, but it'd get lighter as I went. And then I'd also have uh, these tubes of tooth, you know, these toothpaste style tubes that I'd fill with 
kind of a 50-50 mix of peanut butter and honey that give you a lot of energy uh, throughout the day as you as you as you ate it. And and so what what I always thought was that the food that they had at Philmont was you know it was, it's mediocre. It was uh, there's a lot of sugary stuff that I don't like. And I usually like having a higher protein diet because I think that it gives you more long-term energy. And so I would always bring along, uh, you know, beef jerky or bags of tuna or just something that I could eat, uh, you know, peanut butter. Something's going to have a lot of just energy density that I could that I could uh, you know consume each day. And uh, and I thought that was a good investment on uh, on the weight. And so it's a trade-off. A lot of it comes down to what can you comfortably carry. You know, some people want to try and keep their pack down, down at 40 pounds. Other people try and go go more more about 60. You know, I can I can get away with the luxury because I'm, I'm I'm able to carry quite a bit. Uh, and I I think that the the rule of thumb is you don't want to carry more than about a quarter or a third of your of your body weight, something like that. What uh, what what do they suggest, Dad, these days? Because I know it's changed. Probably the least possible. Um... At my age, you know, I was 76 when I hiked Philmont, uh, the most recent trip. Uh, this summer, if I'm able to go, uh, I would be 78. At my age, they're very nice, and they say, Mr. Deaver, you uh, you can carry the toilet paper. Um, but the younger ones, you know, here, somebody's got to carry the pot, the cooking pot. How about the camp stove? How about this? How about that? And before you know it, you know, that weight creeps up that you could be carrying 5, 10 or more pounds of, of crew gear. Um, and, the, and there's the food. You do a food pickup. Uh, what we do is uh, when we do a food pickup, uh, before we hike onward, uh, you know, it's at a staff camp. We do what we call surgery. We cut open the plastic uh, two-person food bags, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we remove the things we don't want just rather than carry the weight and we put them in the swap box there at, at the, uh, the food pickup place. Other people come along and say, wow, you know, sugar drink, sugar, sugar, sugar. It's wonderful. Uh, whereas in, in our case, we might say, wow, I found a pouch of tuna. I found some trail mix. So, you know, you go for the things you want. Uh, you, know, you can put in what you want and take out what you want uh, at these uh, swap boxes. I, I guess the final thing that I would say is that don't worry about not having all the right stuff. So what I started doing after after about my second trip at film, I think I went a couple times as a scout and then I started going as an adult leader and I would usually bring some extra stuff with me just because there was always a scout that would not have something important. And and so there's going to be a few stronger people in the crew that are going to bring along extra stuff just in case, just for that purpose. Well, but, like an extra pair of socks or, or yeah, something ex- they exactly, might need last minute. Exactly. Yeah. But um, it's always, in my opinion, it's always good to pack too much because when you're at Philmont, you can always discard a few things and put them in the locker. But if you don't bring mm-hmm. it at all, then you don't have that option. They have, we haven't discussed it, but there's a shakeout, you know, where uh, at base camp, you basically go to the tent that you're in. It's a big walled tent, a concrete floor. And you, you know, go through a shakeout where you take your uh, steel cot and drag it out and put it outside the tent. And the ranger goes through a packing list. Okay, hold up your rain gear. You know, who's got rain pants? Okay rain jacket and you know on and on and on um and you go through the different gear and the guy says no you don't need this or you don't need that um and you know or you can share your toothpaste between two of you or something so he finds ways to cut down oh one thing yeah. did i show my uh, well hats? Speak, speaking speaking of the sh- well before you get to that speaking of the shakeout what i would do since like i said i like to bring along my luggeries is i always had my luxury bag of the, all the stuff that i knew the ranger wouldn't let me bring and i'd stick that aside and I wouldn't show it to him. That way I had everything like a like a good little scout that I was supposed to bring along and nothing that I wasn't supposed to have. And then when we were putting it all back in the backpack, when the ranger wasn't looking, I'd take the bag of my luxury items and put it uh, put it in my backpack. That's presuming someone's a strong hiker like you are. But, well, uh, you know, we're not supposed to say that, that, that trick. Anyway, um, here's a broad brimmed hat in a bright color. And here's a baseball cap in a bright color. I like I, t- I would likely take both those. Neither one weighs a whole lot. The, uh, the baseball cap with a bill on it is nice because if, if it's raining and you put the hood up on your rain jacket, uh, the bill on it kind of holds the front of the hood uh, properly and it works pretty well. Whereas if it's really, really sunny, 
this uh, floppy broad brimmed hat uh, tends to work well in the sun, covers more of you than, than the, the baseball cap. Anyway, uh, any last thoughts? Anything we haven't covered? Um, I'd usually leave the, I'd usually, personally, I'd leave the baseball hat. I'd bring the broad brimmed hat. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess my final thing is don't bring along anything that you're that you'd really lose your head over if it got destroyed because sometimes stuff happens and uh and so if there's something well, that's that, really really important that, that brings to you. up one thing uh, you know for travel to and from Philmont and, and base camp there's cell phone service in base camp there's a cell phone tower there uh in base camp but going out on the trail as an advisor i will probably take my cell phone put it in ziploc bag or double ziploc bag and just stash it inside my uh my laundry bag, um, and people will have cameras. They can take pictures, and you can share pictures after after the trek. Um, you don't want to risk breaking or losing a cell phone on, you know, getting it wet. Uh, or if you are uh, going to bring a the, cell the phone, bring like one of those little hundred dollar LG phones. Don't bring your thousand dollar iPhone. Good, good point. And also for travel, you want to bring a, a, a power cube, uh, one to you know that will plug into the wall, another one uh, that's a power storage cube that you can charge it up. Uh, at base camp, it'd be hard to find. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of power out outlets at base camp. You're better just to have a charging cube or the bus going to or from uh, Philmont in our case. Um, some people would drive in cars. If, of course, if you live closer or go by train or go by charter bus. But in our particular case, um, having having charging and plug-in capabilities for your cell phone would be good. I think we've pretty well covered everything here. And I'll, and I'll include the packing list in the uh, in the description uh, below to okay. for people to be able to, to go through stuff. Now, since I wear eyeglasses, here's a, a hard case, you know, that won't smash that I could put my eyeglasses in at night if I'm sleeping, just so nothing happens to the eyeglasses. I think that uh, pretty well covers it. I think, yeah, okay. I think, I think so. All right. Well, um, let's, uh, let's get on to, uh, what I'll do is I'll stop the recording here and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, go do uh do some closing thoughts so okay but i think this is a pretty good overview of uh of what the gear looks like and some of the pros and cons of stuff all right so now that we've gone over kind of in detail the packing uh you know and some of the equipment uh, i want to kind of close up uh with a, with a few thoughts so so first off how, how you pack for film is going to be very similar for packing for any other sort of high adventure uh, activity, uh, you know, and, and it's going to depend on on the environment and, and where you're going. But I think I think the big lesson is that you really want to get quality gear if you can afford it. And there's certain things you can skimp on, and certain things you really can't. You know, your your boots, your backpack, uh, your tent, and your sleeping bag are probably your really big items. Uh, that I'd say. Is there? What 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 are your thoughts, Dad? Well, and you could say in terms of having these expensive waterproof stuff sacks, you can get by sort of with uh, two gallon and one gallon Ziploc bags as a cheaper workaround. Or as, as you discussed, your sleeping bag stuff sack, I uh, use the one that came with a sleeping bag. It's not waterproof, but stuff the sleeping bag into it and then put that in, into a, a waterproof plastic bag, garbage, you know, heavy duty garbage bag, uh, regular weight garbage bag will snag or rip and tear after 10 days. But uh, there are workarounds uh, that you can kind of get by on it. And, and and what I would what I would advise is that if you have any questions, you can comment below and we can have a discussion. Uh, and and what I'll what I'll do is I'll uh, even though even though Dad doesn't have a YouTube uh, account, as we uh, as we uh, actually you've got a you've got a Gmail. Can we we could probably what I'll probably do is if anybody has any questions. I'll, uh, we can always do a follow-up video about specific questions, or we can have a discussion in the comments. But uh, I, I think this is pretty thorough. And, and the other thing you got to really consider is there's going to be surprises. There's going to be emergencies, like that one time when we were in that freak hailstorm up on top of Mount Phillips, or or when all those uh, the, that explore uh, group of girls had had all the hypothermia, and we had to go help with that. There's always going to be something that goes wrong, and so you want to be prepared for that. Um, and a lot of it comes down to your own physical uh, conditioning. You know, in, in my case, I was a very strong hiker. I wasn't very fast, but I, was, I could carry a lot of weight. So it was no big deal for me to carry a few extra things to help people out. 
and and you you'll find probably... you'll find in a given cruise some people can carry more some people less and you just kind of share the weight around so you can hike at pretty much the same right. speed in fact and, you and, want to stay together as a crew and and you and you discuss it you know you're gonna you're gonna want to have a discussion as a crew what kind of extra stuff should we bring along for an emergency and kind of divvy that up as part of the crew gear but then i would also bring some personal emergency stuff just like i'd always bring along some of those uh those uh, mylar emergency blankets Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm talking about? So I'd, I'd bring, I'd usually or, bring or, or, extra one of those. Or do garbage bags, contractor, trash bags. Yeah, I'd bring some contractor too. bags. Um, I'd bring along a, uh, I'd bring along a, a Sharpie. And then what I'd do is I'd take uh, some of the one inch wide uh, thinner duct tape and I'd wrap it around the Sharpie uh, just enough that I could unroll it and have some duct tape to go patch things. The duct tape is a wonderful thing to take as a, you know, as a Although as nowadays supplement. I'd probably take the Gorilla Tape instead because it's stronger. Well, but, I think I think we pretty well covered it here. Um, anything else? No, I think this wraps it up, and we can always do a follow-up video if there's any other if there's any other questions. So, the big thing is just have a good time and just understand the first time you go to Philmont, there's going to be something you forget, and and it's it's a learning experience. Like like Dad was saying, it's kind of like it's kind of like going to a camping university. You know, you you don't do it for just one semester. It's going to take as you go through a couple of trips, you're going to get really good at this and, and it's going to prepare you for other adventures in, in the future. Or the other thing that I find is that I'm pretty much comfortable in any environment. You know, if I'm, if the power goes out in the house uh, or the neighborhood, you know, no big deal. I have my camping gear. I'll pull out my sleeping bag if it's freezing and the heat goes out and I just, I just deal with it. Uh, the, the real shame, the real shame is that more people don't get ex to experience this. I think scouting is probably the best uh, hidden secret in America. Uh, in my generation, a uh, very, very high percent of the young people went into, into scouting. Now very few do, and they tend to spend their time, you know, indoors on internet or, you know, video games or whatever. You really need to get out and, and deal with the real world. Yeah. Uh, it's soothing to the soul. It's, it's good psychologically, and it teaches you how to deal with life. One one other one other thought I want to wrap up on. Whenever I go, so I do a lot of road trips, and whenever I'm traveling, I always l look at where am I, I'm going to be traveling through, not just my destination. And if it's winter time, I'll bring along winter emergency gear in, in the car. And 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 a lot of the stuff that you're doing for Philmont, you can throw your Philmont bag in the back of your car. And if there's a problem, you've got you've got what you need. Or in the summertime. You know, there's a time that we we're stuck uh, out in the desert uh, because of an accident and the highway was blocked off and I had a bunch of extra water and I was able to share it around with some of the other some of the other uh, drivers or in uh, in the winter once we got stuck in this polar vortex blizzard thing and and we were we were stranded for uh, for a couple days at this uh, hotel that had no power and I was the only one who'd brought along you know my heavy winter gear so that I could go out and 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 get food from from local gas stations or, or other places so if you get into the philmont mindset for any for any trip that you're going to take and and understand not just where you're going but the journey you're going to be the path you're going to take to get there and you pack accordingly you're going to find that your philmont bag and this gear that you get for philmont you're going to use it for all kinds of other stuff so get the right stuff get you know spend the money get the good gear it's better to have a few really nice things than a lot of garbage. And that's that's kind of my closing thoughts. One one final thing, you know, Philmont is the icing on the cake as far as scouting. It's Scouting University. And uh, being in New York City where it's so hard to get outdoors, you know, we do have scout camps, but sometimes they have flush toilets and things like that. It really, you know, prepares our kids for life uh, to get out and deal with uh, the preparations and forward thinking needed for Philmont. So... Uh, it's not easy to go more than once, uh, but, you know, it's it's a wonderful experience. I've enjoyed going as a, an adult leader, uh, just watching the kids grow mentally and emotionally and, and, and learning from it. So it's it's a real privilege to go, and if you can go more than once, it's a wonderful experience. Yeah, especially especially because it, te it, it teaches you the mindset for how to deal with hardship and how to be in a very – how to be at peace with your surroundings no matter how difficult uh, difficult the challenge is. So I hope I hope you kids uh, enjoy this. Hope the this is useful to adults. Oh, one one well. last one last thing. Yeah, I bought a T-shirt at uh, one of our Greater New York Council Scout camps, 
On the sleeve, it says uh, Greater New York Councils. On the front, it says camping is, the, it shows a campfire here. Camping is the answer. It doesn't matter what the question, what is it? Nope. Who cares, about, what does who it cares say? what the question is? Yeah, camping doesn't matter is what the, the answer. Who is. cares what the so question is? So camping is answer. It doesn't matter what the question is. There, There is a certain peace and quiet uh, that, that you, that you uh, get mentally just from being out in the wilderness without all the modern distractions. So, all right. Okay. Well, uh, I hope everybody liked this video. Please share it with your friends. Add a comment down below if you want to add to the conversation. And subscribe to the channel if you want to see uh, more content like this. And we'll see you next time. Thank you and good night.